this is Janelle Rhiannon, the author of the Homeric Chronicles and the podcaster for Greek Mythology Retold. If you're finding this video, it's probably because you are a fan of Greek mythology. Maybe you've read one of my books in the Homeric Chronicles series, uh, Song of Sacrifice or Rise of Princes. Maybe you've heard my podcast, Greek Mythology Retold. So, uh, I obviously write and think a lot about Greek mythology. I'm sharing with you my analysis and research and the conclusions that I've drawn related to certain characters who are uh, in the Trojan War or related tangentially or something to Trojan War uh, main characters. Today I want to talk about Leda. Leda is the queen of Sparta. She's the original queen of Sparta. We often think of Helen as being the queen but uh, she, she only she followed in her mother's footsteps. So who was Leda? Leda was a princess. She, she was an Aetolian princess before she married uh, Tyndarius. And together they had four of the most famous children, pa uh, Pollux, Castor, Clytemnestra, and Helen. Now, these four children, have a really cool story about being hatched from eggs. In my series, I try to look at the characters as pretty much as, as human beings. So I think about, well, if, if, if Lita was a human woman, is she really gonna give birth to eggs? Probably not. But the idea of the eggs comes from the circumstances that at least two of the children got their DNA from Zeus. The story goes that a giant black swan ravished her or seduced her. I think that's probably a nice way of, I just touched my face. Oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, that That's a nice way of saying that she was raped. There's really no way that uh, a giant swan is going to come at you as a woman and you're gonna find that enticing at all in any way whatsoever. A giant, if you've ever, if you've ever seen those funny videos of geese or swans chasing little kids around a park and they're screaming, they're terrified, they're, they're very aggressive kind of animals. So when you think about this giant swan coming at you, so giant, big, like, you know, human size or larger than a regular swan, that would be rather terrifying. I feel like that whole situation is really more like rape. Now think about how, and I don't mean to, yeah. So think about how Zeus approaches mortal women on other occasions, for example, like rain. A mortal woman, a human woman, would not be able to withstand Zeus. If Zeus was going to take her, he was going to do it whether she wanted to or not. So this experience, this, this rape by Zeus, this experience with Zeus then is, the story goes, prov provides four eggs. She gives birth to four eggs. Now in my podcast, I really go into detail about, uh, in episodes one through three, I go into detail about how the chronology of say Castor and Pollux and Clytemnestra and Helen, that what they're attribute, the things that they are credited with doing in the Greek mythology and it can't, doesn't really go together. There's the, if you try to put a chronology to that, it doesn't work. For example, when Helen is kidnapped by Theseus when she's a young girl around like, you know, 11, 12, her brothers or come to her rescue and they basically burn most of Athens to the ground. This is not something that 12 year old boys do. This is more like grown men. We have vase paintings that show Castor and Pollux being grown men when Helen is hatching from the egg. So we have this discrepancy about the chronology and I don't think that they were all born at the same time. I don't, I think that there's probably, it's not like there's two sets of twins, if you will. Um, it seems more likely that the story is 
is relating to us that at least two of the children, Pollux and Helen, have the DNA, if you will, of Zeus. And that is the consistent part. When you try to put some kind of chronology, what comes first, second, third, fourth, whatever, um, and so forth, you you have to you kind of have to look at what is the what is what is the main point of that story what is what is it trying to get across to us as the listener or as the reader so i pretty much debunk the four eggs at one time in my podcast and it's kind of detailed and i go through it in episodes one through three and um you, you're welcome to go you know, listen to that. Uh, but right now, I just kind of want to roll back and look at how this experience then affects Lita. Lita then has to deal with a lot of things. She, being, being accosted by Zeus is going to affect her as a woman. It's going to affect her the kind of relationship she has with her children. And not because she doesn't love her children, whether they are Tyndareus's or Zeus's, but in the world of Greek mythology, in that world, Zeus is all powerful and his wife, Hera, is very vengeful and very jealous and manipulating. And it would be frightening to be too close to your children, um, to talk about what happened with Zeus because the retribution would be very severe. Lita, in my books, I I sort I write I write the character for her that she's she's rather cold and she's rather distant, and and it's for her safety as well as the, the safety of her children. Hera's not very kind to not just the women who have children by Zeus. She's also not very kind to the uh, demi-mortals that are birthed around the earth by mortal, mortal women. So it's in her best interest not to draw a lot of attention to herself and to her family. And she does that by being sort of a kind of a distant mother she in her relation but it doesn't mean she doesn't love her kids i find that lita is having experienced the things that she experienced being subjugated by zeus being perhaps worried her entire life about what retribution hera might uh throw at her she is determined, she's a, she's a character who is determined to show her strength and to garner what strength she can as a woman in the Bronze Age world. I, I often have, um, touched my face again, <laughs> but I'm at home, I'm okay, right? I'm okay. Um, women, women in the Bronze Age didn't have a lot of control about their daily world and their daily life they were second, they had to subjugate themselves to whatever their husbands wanted, even a queen. Um, but it doesn't mean that women didn't find a way to achieve power in their realm as much as they could. I have a, uh, in this chapter, I have a chapter about Clytemnestra and Lita, and I want to read this section to you. It's before she has to marry, it's before Clytemnestra has to marry Agamemnon, and she doesn't want to do it. And Lita says to her daughter, Lita took her daughter roughly by the shoulders, shaking her words into the young woman between clenched teeth. You stupid girl, have you not learned already? Do you think men the only creatures who go to war, the only ones who gird themselves in armor? You think there's more bravery in hacking a man in two than the plight of women who pass by the horror, slipping on the blood and shit of strangers to find their men, bring them home, stitch their gaping holes, praying to the gods for their healing all the while knowing death drags them to the underworld? Every step you take, 
Every word you utter is a strategy in a war for control of your world. Agamemnon has won the first battle. Tears slid down her daughter's cheek and Leda gentled her tone. Gird yourself, my darling, with your words, your plans, and don't let him win the war. I wrote that scene because I really wanted to show that Lita loves her daughter and she also understands that women have to, they have to gather power in their world with, within what was the acceptable range for women during the Bronze Age. She can't just go on a campaign that would be equivalent to say modern feminism because that, that wouldn't work. That, um, that would be disingenuous to that time period. So, I, and I think that Lita really, she loved her children. They were, for all the reasons I just said, it was very difficult to be able to show that or express that because she would um, be subjected to who knows what. Um, the other chapter I want to, section I wanted to read to you is in this book, but I do have this one, it is that, Butterly, buttery, soft. Uh, it just, I can't explain what it feels feels like, but I, I really like the rich colors of this one. I probably should order my own book, right? So I have a copy of it. All right. Um, anyway, in Rise of Princes, I tell the story of Castor and Pollux. And if you're, if you don't know who Castor and Pollux are, they are the Gemini. They are the Discuri. And they are the two brothers that are tossed into the stars and they are the children of, of Leda. So let me read this to you and then we can talk about it. How about that? Okay. This is actually uh, chapter 22. All right. Brothers forever. This is Sparta in 1248 BC. There is nowhere I wish to be. Oh, after, by the, before I read this, this is be, Castor and Pollux have been ambushed and killed, so they die. Which, obviously, they have to, if they're going to become stars up in the heavens, then they're not alive. Okay. Nowhere, pause, <laughs> my own book. There is nowhere I wish to be, nowhere I wish to live, and no breath I wish to take. Apollo's descending light broke through the shadowy eve in thin golden streaks as Leda's grief weighed her heart to the ground. I no longer wish to live at all. Yet she walked on aimlessly, one foot falling in front of the other. The bright stars scattered across the heavens, sparkling in their glory, were less in number than the tears streaking down her ashen cheeks. Her legs would carry her no more and she collapsed, mindless to the hard ground, scraping through her gown and bloodying her knees. She wept freely now, cursing life and death and all the gods. The clouds circling the high peak of Olympus couldn't shield Zeus from the pitiful mourning of Leda for her sons, for Clytemnestra, for Helen. He knew the depth of her misery came at his hand. He had used her to create Helen. He'd swept Pollux up at his death, breathing immortality into his decaying flesh, preventing her from mourning him with her mortal, with his mortal brother. When the gods could stand the way, oh my God. When the god could stand the wailing no more, he slipped quietly from the heavens to lead his side. Daughter, why are you weeping? Lita's eyes flew open and she scrambled backwards, fear clutching her breasts, stifling her grief momentarily. Zeus towered above her as he crouched at her as she crouched at his feet, shivering with apprehension. His silver hair flowed around his shoulders, his skin shimmering in the pale moonlight. He reached to comfort the distraught mortal. With a cold finger, he lifted her delicate chin to his face, instantly recognizing the awe and horror in her eyes. Lita stammered, what do you want? You have taken everything from me. Her shoulders slumped with her wretchedness and weariness of doom and treacheries and betrayals. I can bear no more. Lita turned her face away. Do what you will with me. I care for nothing anymore. I haven't taken all, 
Zeus replied, his voice gentled by his own regret. He thought of Thetis in that moment, gentle Thetis. Her long black hair flowing about her body like a dark wave and her red lips like pomegranates, her soft hands and delicate feet still haunted him. He knew loss and pain, for he loved the nymph who was forever denied to him. In his agony and anger, he had roughly taken this mortal for a second time in the guise of a giant swan to satisfy his grief and force the prophecies to come. I don't understand, Leda whispered hoarsely, her misery clinging to every word. Pollux remains in this world, daughter, as an immortal. Leda slowly shook her head, blinking disbelief from her eyes. And what of Castor? Where is my other son? Where mortals dwell when they pass through the flesh and bone of this life, Castor resides in the underworld. Soon his company will be the greatest heroes who ever lived. Leda wept anew, one beloved boy in the clouded realm beyond her embrace and one a wraith in the realm of shadows. They lived their entire lives side by side, from my womb to death, and now you separate them in the afterlife for all eternity? You are the cruelest of the gods. The aging queen no longer cared if she lived or died. If the gods struck her with blazing streaks of fire, cast her into Poseidon's cold depths, or tore her limb from limb. You've taken my entire family from me cursed my daughters into misery and shame, and now deny my sons, my sons. Pulling open her gown, she exposed her breasts heavy with age and raged and beat her chest. I suckled them with life. I suckled them, my sons. Her pain choking her words became a primal howl unleashed into the night. As she quieted, Zeus gently said, Pollux's laments are daily heard. He wishes to be with his brother, side by side, as you say. Zeus knelt before her, and the god never bent the knee. He takes no joy in immortality. Leda continued sobbing, oblivious to the god. Is that your wish, Leda? that they be reunited. Looking up, she saw compassion. It is. Zeus stood and in a voice booming like thunder, he commanded, cast your eyes to the stars then daughter, far to the north. He waved his hand toward the heavens and a streak of sparkling light flashed above as the father of the gods set a series of flaming points into the inky black sky. There they are, he pointed high above them. The Discuri, Gemini, they will be called. The two brothers, never to be separated again. He gazed down at the mortal weeping at his feet. Always know that the tears of their mother moved the god to pity. In silver mist, Zeus disappeared, leaving Leda to marvel at the blinking stars. My sons, she whispered, stretching her hand out to the heavens. Fresh tears blurred her vision. My sons. So I tried to write inside of the stories how Lita loved her children and how their trials and tribulations and their deaths affected her profoundly and broke her heart. And yet to be so, just as any parents, you know, you're really kind of helpless to do anything that affects your children. So um, that's it. That's what I have for you today. I hope that you learned something about Lita and maybe uh, it prompts you to uh, read some Greek mythology, you know? Okay, so that's it. That's all I have for today and I'll see you next time. Ciao.